Hey guys, what's happening? So we are back for part two of the eight deaths of Spider-Man because the covenant of Sidorak must continue. So with that said, if you're enjoying these videos, be sure to drop a like, subscribe if you're new to the channel, and don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications. All right, so coming back, we jump right into the action at the Sanctum Sanctorum, where Peter's come to retrieve what he would describe as either a grimoire a tome, or even a magical phone book to help him prepare for his upcoming fights with the remaining scions of Sidorak. But to retrieve this book, Peter's got to get through Doctor Strange's heightened magical security, because after Doctor Strange lent his title of Sorcerer Supreme to Doctor Doom back in Blood Hunt, Strange cranked up the security in the Sanctum Sanctorum as a way of keeping Sorcerer Supreme Doom from just strolling in there and taking whatever he wants. But that's definitely one of those things where we're gonna have to wait and see how well it works out. Because even now with Spider-Man bringing Black Cat along with him to pull this off, the two of them had broken into the Sanctum Sanctorum before, among countless others if we're being honest here. So it's really like what's to stop Doom from getting in here if he wanted to, even with this mega ultimate magical lockdown, as Peter would call it. But also another reason why they had to break in is mainly because Strange still doesn't have his body. But nonetheless, they're still able to make it work because they get in, they grab the book, and they're right back out. But as they leave, there's a funny moment here where Peter's like, wonderful window smasher, wahoo. And Strange is just like, that. that isn't a spell. And Felicia's more or less like, come on, man, let him have his fun and be thankful you never heard such an exclamation under romantic circumstances. And Strange is just like, that's an image. But soon after this, Peter realizes that he's going to need some time with this book and he's not quite ready to dive in yet. And so right there, Felicia's like, ah, was that the Obsidian Obelisk of Obvious? And it's like, you know what? That, that was actually a good one. But rather than just trying to skim through and pick up a spell or two, Peter wants to get a real cram session in so he can get ready for the next sign of Sidorak. I mean, at this point, Felicia, she's been filled in on most of what's going on here. So she's definitely concerned about the part that involves Peter dying. And for a moment here, it almost seems as if she thought that this book would be a solution or a way to prevent that. But Strange just tells her the book's not a panacea. Will it help Spider-Man? Sure, but it's not like a full stop solution for everything that's going on here. So then she asks, why is this his problem to face alone? So Strange tells her, once Earth's champion is named, they must fulfill the covenant. Even if I could join you, direct involvement against the scions violates the pact and that's why having his astral projection here as more or less of a coach is the best that he can do for the time being so peter just lets her know that he has the reeds of ragador which is how he comes back but before felicia leaves there's a moment here where she says i hope you'll pick up the phone once in a while when you aren't in a crisis did you know that i'm single again and peter's just like no hey i'm sorry there are some amazing dating apps so she just swings away saying i pray that your talent for saying the exact wrong thing at the wrong time help save the world. And even Strange is like, man, you fumbled that one. But Peter's just like, man, I wasn't bitten by a radioactive Romeo. And after she leaves, Peter tries to find out from Strange what he needs to do to win this, only for Strange to tell him that there is no winning, which just reminds me of what we talked about before. As far as how Doctor Strange and Spider-Man just think different, because first and foremost, it's Strange's fault that this is even a thing. And it's like a lot of the time from Strange's perspective, it's almost like you have to suffer greatly to obtain great power, which perhaps has to do with how he became Doctor Strange in the first place. If you want to take it all the way back to the accident, the surgery, comertage, but when it comes to Spider-Man, he looks at things like a problem that just needs to be solved. Like what's the equation? What are the variables? Solve for X, so to speak, as opposed to Doctor Strange, who's just gambling with the fate of humanity here. But either way, I digress. But nonetheless, Strange ends up telling Peter when he made the covenant with Sidorak, he knew Sidorak rigged it in his favor, so Strange rigged it in his own, hence the reeds. And over the years, there's never been a contest where Strange used less than eight reeds, which just has Peter asking him, how did you do this? Over and over again. So Strange just tells him, there are fates worse than death, Peter worse than deaths and it's just like man dr strange you just might be a masochist or at least you have the tendencies because like who would set themselves up like this but either way after this we head over to the crimson cosmos and with how this is done it's almost like those old cartoons where you can hear the villains from outside the lair because now when we go over to the signs of sidorak the first thing we hear is strange has been neutered <laughs> the human called doom is distracted an insect stands as earth's champion in the covenant <laughs> but really, when we take a look at these guys, we quickly find out that they all have a different understanding on what this covenant means. Because for Centros, he believes this is a gift from their father, so one of them can prove their worthiness and claim the throne. Calix believes that this is each of them getting the opportunity 
to claim Earth in their father's name, and given the current circumstances, he thinks now's a better time than ever. But of all the Saiyans we see here, who we'll see more of eventually as the contest continues, one of the mentions that at least Kallax sees is as a sham that it is. Cause like we saw when Sidorak first made this covenant with Strange, he was only doing this for his own entertainment. And at face value, they're all just playing the roles that have been set for them by a human at that. So for her, unlike her siblings, who are either hoping to win this contest so they can be worthy to take the throne of Sidorak, who is unmovable, by the way, or for some of the other siblings who are hoping to conquer Earth and claim it for themselves, she has her eyes on the real prize, which is freedom, because unlike the others, she at least knows that she's a prisoner. And I gotta admit, I think it's a really interesting addition, because now it introduces the whole idea of at least one of the Saiyans wanting something that's beyond just winning the contest for Sidorak. And that can make for some interesting turns down the line. But following this, when we go back to Peter, who's getting his mystical cram session in, it's here we find him talking to Norman Osborn and filling him in on the whole thing. And just as a reminder, for a while now, Norman osborne has been a good guy after the whole thing with Sin Eater. He took Peter under his wing at Oscorp, gave him a new suit, glider, he's been helping him out. But in response to what Peter's told him here, Norman's just like, I don't believe in magic. And Peter's just like, you didn't understand the assignment, Norman, <laughs> as if he didn't see the flying book. But right here, Norman just drops the news on Peter and tells him that he's shutting down Oscorp effective immediately, which are one of the many changes that are going to be happening around 616 Spider-Man in Marvel Comics, most of which, from what I've seen, are changes for the better. But in the here and now, Norman tells Peter that this is why he showed up to his apartment unannounced with pizza, you know, to give him the news. And Norman's reason for doing this is because to him, Oscorp represents so many mistakes and so much of his pain. So to fully explore the new lease on life that Peter gave him, he feels like he needs to start over. But on the topic of what Peter's dealing with right now, Norman tells him death, even of a temporary sort, has a way of draining the colors out of things. And it drove him mad. So in a way, he's just kind of warning Peter to be careful with all that's going on. But in the middle of this talk, Peter gets a message from Aunt May, letting him know that he was supposed to be at Feast a while ago. So Peter rushes out, and you can tell that there's more that Norman wants to say. But as soon as Peter walks through the door, he's sent to his next contest to face Cyperion, who he quickly refers to as a teleporting space beetle. And so, of course, with Peter getting pulled out of transit, he's like, hey, man, you know, I got somewhere to be. Do you think perhaps we could reschedule? <laughs> but this guy's just like, no. But going into this, Cyperion, he pretty much sets the rules like, OK, strike me once and I'm conquered. Fail in this realm falls. <laughs> so Spider-Man's just like, OK, we're playing a magic game of tag. Got it. And he's basically like, let's make this quick so I can get back to what I was doing. And for a moment here, we even get an example of what I was talking about as far as Peter's way of thinking, where he's like, even magic follows rules and laws. Figure out the rules, break down the problem via those rules and win. So throughout this fight, Spider-Man's picking up things like, OK, this dude teleports stuff. Check. Does he need a scythe to do it? Nope. Oh, it's just for scything. Check. But Cyperion really gives himself away when he tells Spider-Man that he'll never touch him because he's created an infinitely divisible space between them, as well as there's infinite places to where he can send them, either in whole or just partially. And as soon as he does this, it's very disorienting for Peter, as he feels different parts of himself being sent to different ends of the universe. Though at the same time, this gives Peter an idea. So next, he tethers the two of them together for a moment. So it's like wherever Cyperion goes, he goes. So after that, Peter calls out the kaleidoscopic cage of Kun Lun to contain Cyperion within this area, which at the same time works as a bit of a taunt because Cyperion just believes that Spider-Man has a limited mind as far as space and infinite dimensions. So from here, Cyperion goes racing towards the quantum verse, but this just plays right into what Peter has planned. Cause he says here, I knew the dome wouldn't work. Strange told me so when he briefed me on the Scions. He also told me that Cyperion doesn't think about the nature of his power half as much as I think about theoretical physics. There's a model of space-time that suggests if you got in a spaceship and flew straight, you would eventually come back to the same location. It would take an infinite amount of time to get there, but you get there. Now, bear with me. I've always thought the same would be true with scale. Go in one direction, enlarging, or in our case, shrinking. You'd eventually come back around to the size you started. It's just a thought experiment, not the sort of thing one could ever test, unless you were like a magic egomaniac who didn't get past electrons in their reading. And man, it's insanely wild. And it almost sounds like something that Reed Richards would come up with. But for Peter to pull this off to where it makes him super small and super big at the same time, that's insane. 
though this does allow him to both test out and experience these insane feats that were only theoretical before. Though nonetheless, it ultimately once again results in his death, which this time around is by instantaneous disillusion of his atoms through an infinitely recursive fold of space, which of course sends him right back to Phil, where he's got to spend another read of Ragador. And when he comes back, we find Peter just spaced out at dinner with Randy and Shay. So he just tells him it's because he's dealing with a lot, which, which is true, but he says it's more of a thing with the job hunting and disappointing May again, and how he feels like it's a grind that's not getting better. And so of course they try to comfort him, and Randy's just like, if you can't get out of it, get into it, right? And it's like, man, depending on what you're talking about, that could either be great advice or terrible advice. But while they're all here having this talk, the next scion of Sidorak shows up, because it's time for Spider-Man to die again. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.